Hello everyone, and welcome to Archive Viking. Today's subject I want to cover is a subject that is very well known within the pagan community, of which I'm a member, uh, as well as uh, the community at large outside of the pagan community. And that is the subject of the New Age movement, um, of which many of us are familiar with uh, via things like uh, people who think crystals can cure cancer uh, and AIDS to people who think that uh, you can literally control colors to perform magic. <clears throat> so what is the New Age movement? Well, the New Age movement is what you see in this uh, picture right here of a book cover where you get ideas like uh, using spiritual practices to uncover falsehoods, um, and heal your body via things such as chakras, which were borrowed uh, from Indian uh, Hindu practices, which I'll cover in a minute, uh, and various other things, including crystals um, and the like. Uh, it's a very common thing uh, amongst people who like to use, like to use um, uh, scents uh, and you know, um, herbs and other things to uh, heal any kind of ailment, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, such as cancer and, and such. Um, and, and what is the big issue amongst a lot of us pagans, uh, heathens, uh, what, uh, Hellenic pagans, etc., is that these new age pagans, um, tend to uh not always but they do tend to believe that uh their religion goes back thousands of years uh much like ours do and, and the issue with that is that is not the case um it's perfectly fine for them to have these beliefs there's absolutely nothing wrong with it and uh despite my title uh being the look at the racist history of uh the new age movement um did you know it in itself is not inherently racist however they do tend to ignore their history of the first early new age movements being connected to uh racist movements um and they are of course not unique uh my religion heathenry um various other religions have a history of that too and but we acknowledge it fully and so do a lot of new age pagans but unfortunately, a lot of them don't, uh, which again, is not unique. A lot of our uh, members of our communities do as well, but it, it still needs to be covered. So where did it all begin? Well, the New Age movement uh, began <laughs> with uh, began with a lot of people, but one of the most prominent figures was this individual, Madame Helena Blavatsky. A Russian woman uh, who started a movement called Theosophy uh, and believed that she had all kinds of magical powers, such as telepathy. And she founded Theosophy uh, in the late 1800s, um, emphasizing a combination of uh, multiple different religions, specifically Eastern religions. Uh, such as Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism and their combination with Western religions such as Christianity and uh, Judaism and such, regardless of race, which is a good thing. As I said, these, the, you know, these New Age movements are not inherently racist. Uh, however, they did believe in ideas of root races, uh, multiple different root races, such as the race of Lumeria and Atlanteans and all kinds of weird things, uh, as well as a heavy emphasis of multiple reincarnation events over millennia. Uh, the next one will supposedly involve some Buddhist Bodhisattva coming back and uh, reincarnate everyone uh, in some sort of way. I'm not clear on the details, but it, it's stuff like that. Uh, and they also believe that all religions came from a mother religion from either Atlantis or Lemuria or both. Uh, which is not wrong. It is wrong. It's wrong, but it's also not wrong. I'll 
to clarify, it's definitely wrong that all religions came from one religion, but as we see in Indo-European expansions, they did have shared cultures uh, and religious similarities, but they still were distinct religions, and that is uh, the mistake there. Uh, and these beliefs eventually led to uh, a number of offshoots, uh, such as anthroposophy uh, and Arianism. Now, of course, we all recognize what Arianism is, or at least I would hope we will do, because that is the uh, main religious and political belief of the Nazi party. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, influences from this early New Age religion on modern New Age religions, such as Wicca and Eclectic Paganism, which again have an issue of thinking of trying to claim that their religions are older than they actually are. And uh, that is an issue. However, I should also say that uh, these are also aren't inherently bad religions. I have several friends who are Wicca, and I'm aware of uh, and have talked with multiple uh, eclectic pagans. And in fact, a uh, member of my local healing community, Ocean Keltoy, made a video, which I'll link in the iCard, where he talks about how uh, eclectic paganism uh, is not as bad as a lot of uh, normal pagans, uh, I shouldn't say normal, as well as uh, more traditional pagans, such as uh, Heaton, you know, Germanic heathens or uh, Hellenic pagans, etc., uh, make them out to be, and that we could learn a lot from them, uh, and that's certainly right. However, uh, we still have to cover their history with uh, these races and individuals. Now, I could continue this video by going into uh, things talking about Hitler and Himmler and the Nazi party and Arianism and such, but so many different videos talk about them uh, in so many different ways uh, and such, and I'm not going to beat a dead horse on that subject. What I want to cover is a figure who is often overlooked, a figure who did provide a lot of influence as well, um, rather indirectly, but still, on the Nazi parties and uh, beliefs and movements. And that is Roman von Ungarn Sternberg, a Russian noble uh, who was part of the White Army faction during the uh, Russian Civil War uh, against the Bolsheviks uh, in the uh, 1920s and 1910s who had a lot of rather um, <laughs> eccentric, is an understatement, but eccentric beliefs uh, that also eventually led him to try and create a white utopia uh, in East Asia. And I'll cover that uh, in a little bit. But Baron Ungern Sternberg was uh, born uh, in Austria, uh, Hungary, in January 10th of 1886. Um, however, his family fairly quickly, in a, two years later, moved to Russian-controlled Estonia in 1888, where he, this nation, he spent most of his uh, life on. And when he was a youth, he did enter the Russian Military Academy uh, from 1900 to 1902. However, he was uh, kicked out uh, because um, he was generally described as being belligerent, uh, ignored teachers, uh, got into multiple fights, uh, and was generally regarded as a terror in his youth uh, by quite a lot of people. Uh, however, uh, he did eventually uh, serve some action in the uh, Russo-Japanese War in 1905. And while it is um, debated how much battle he saw as in this conflict, because he, by the time he got there, much of the fighting had already uh, begun to wind down. Uh, the fact that he received the Russian, the Russo-Japanese War Medal, uh, something that only people who actually participated in combat uh, received, uh, it does suggest that he did, in fact, uh, participate in this. Um, and because of this and because of his growing up in areas that were once controlled by the Mongol Empire and their successor states, such as the uh, Kremain Khanate uh, and such, uh, he did have a fairly early love in Mongolia, and he, after his uh, serving in the Russo-Japanese War, uh, 
requested and received a uh, station in this uh, eastern border of Russia, bordering Mongolia uh, and Russia, and actually made quite a lot of friends amongst uh, the Mongolian, uh, uh, you know, the public Mongolian, the common Mongolian people. Uh, so he did make that uh, quite easy for him. Uh, however, eventually an event known as World War I or the Great War broke out, uh, where uh, he served um, in the Russian military fighting against uh, the Ottomans as well as, well as Austro-Hungary uh, and the German Empire. And he uh, was well known for being uh, again, rather belligerent to his uh, commanding officers, um, and he didn't receive a lot of promotions because of this, uh, but he was loved by uh, the general soldiers, uh, especially in the cavalry, uh, where he was known for, um, despite being their commander, sharing their, uh, sleeping on the same ground, sharing their meals, uh, etc., and so he was loved by his men, but hated by the higher ups, uh, with the exception of an individual known as Grigory uh, Simeonov, who became his commander and who, much like Ungarn, was known for being a terror amongst the ranks, uh, ignored his higher ups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they became uh, fast friends. Uh, and it was around this time. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, despite um, them fighting in World War I to protect the uh, Tsarist Russia, uh, Bolshevik, the Bolshevik Revolution uh, under Lenin uh, rose up and, of course, overthrew and slaughtered most of, if not all, probably all, of the Russian royal family. And so, because of this, uh, Simeonov uh, and Ungarn and all, all the other um, royalist uh, forces fled to the eastern part of the Russian Empire and began multiple guerrilla uh, campaigns against the communist uh, Russian government. Um, and it's certainly uh, true that they uh, did gain a lot of victories. However, it should also be noted that the Bolsheviks were much more powerful, uh, and also <laughs> they, the public, uh, the commoners, everyone uh, generally didn't like Ungern and Simonov and the white Russians because they were very brutal to everyone else, not just the Bolsheviks. So they would raid into villages and slaughter people, um, everything, you know, take their stuff. And so <laughs> because of their actions, more and more of the general public began fleeing uh, inciting to fleeing to inciting with the uh, Bolshevik Russians. Um, and uh, should also be noted that Ungarn started to have sort of, I don't want to say a mental breakdown, but he definitely wasn't the same. He began to believe, due to some sort of hallucinogenic dream, that he was the descendant of Chinggis Khan. He was the descendant, descendant of Chinggis Khan, who was to recreate the Mongol Empire at its height. Uh, and because with this new destiny, he would create uh, a utopia uh, called Shambhala, or we know it as Shangri-La, but originally it was called Shambhala, for generally only white people. I mean, he did um, use this, use this uh, rhetoric uh, to gather Japanese and Cossack uh, and Mongolian uh, soldiers to his cause as well, but he generally wanted it more for white people, uh, and his, so his plan was to recreate the Mongol Empire and create Shambhala out of it, um, for every white Russian he could find uh, and defeat the Bolsheviks and kill the Jews because, of course, he was, uh, like the Nazis, uh, anti-Semitic uh, and become its all-time ruler. And so uh, with this belief in mind, he uh, broke off his... Uh, 
support of Semyonov and fled to Mongolia at a time known as the Mongol Revolution of 1921, where uh, the Mongolian uh, province at the time uh, was rebelling against uh, the Republic of China uh, for its independence. And you can sort of see in this map the public, uh, the, the general uh, political map uh, climate of the time, where at one point in time, everything in this map was part of the Chinese Republic or Chinese Empire. Um, but during the chaos of uh, the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s and the rebellion against the Qing Dynasty, etc., uh, more and more provinces began to break off. First Tibet, uh, and then Xinjiang, uh, and then Manchuria was taken uh, by the Japanese. And so Mongolia was sort of the next step in this. Uh, and Ungarn uh, wanted to help it. Uh, and one of the people he contacted was this individual, uh, the Eighth Bolt Khan, who was also uh, the reincarnation of uh, a particular lama uh, in Tibetan uh, theology. And so he offered his support to the Bolt Khan's re uh, rebellion. And he also gained the support of the general public of Mongolia because they began to believe that he was a Buddhist war god incarnate. Which Buddhist war god, we don't know because there are quite a few. Uh, and as many uh, pagans, uh, myself included, will tell you, to you know, say that a god is the god of X is too simplistic because oftentimes gods have multiple duties. Um, for example, uh, Apollo Apollon is the god of light, but he's also the god of music and the god of healing, etc., etc. Thor is a god of strength, but he's also uh, summoned to fight disease and uh, to bring rain to crops, etc., etc. So this was already a, a simplistic thing and difficult to determine, but <laughs> Once Ungarn heard this, it fed into his egotism uh, even more. So he also too began to believe that he was a Buddhist god and a war god incarnate. So under this belief and with the support of uh, the Bodh Khan and the Buddhist population, uh, he, and after his uh, breaking of his allegiance to uh, Semyonov, he invaded Mongolia and uh, in, in October 1920, and was able to drive out the Chinese military by uh, late, mid to late 1921, where he then was given uh, the title of Duke by the Bodh Khan. And while he did ha ha hold this title of Duke, he, in, his, in essence, was um, <laughs> the de facto ruler of Mongolia. Um, to a point. I mean, the Bodh Khan still had quite a lot of authority, but so did uh, Ungar. And he showed this by uh, slaughtering J any Jews he could find uh, and killing as many political opponents and jailing as many political opponents as well. Um, however, it should also be noted that he did do some good things. He helped build schools and libraries uh, and allowed people to buy the freedom of prisoners to improve their karma, but he made quite a lot of enemies, including those amongst his ranks. Um, and he, he also he did try to create a religiously uh, diverse uh, kingdom. However, he, he did it at the exclusion of Jews. Uh, Jews were not allowed and would be slaughtered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but uh, he did not stop there. Eventually, he did try to uh, invade uh, Soviet Russia, which at the time was uh, almost completely conquering uh, Siberia and the eastern part of the Russian Empire. Um, but despite this invasion, he faced very little success. Uh, and in fact, when he returned to Mongolia, the Soviet forces uh, defeated him and took the capital of Mongolia, uh, Urga, now modern-day Ulaanbaatar, from Ungar, uh, who then attempted to flee to Tibet because he had been in contact with the Dalai Lama. 
uh, at the time. Um, however, this didn't work out very well either because Ungern's forces um, began to mutiny against him and attempt to assassinate him due to a variety of factors. One, they had been fighting too many losing battles against the Soviets. Two, he was brutal uh, to them. He had begun to become uh, tyrannical, uh, much like he was in Mongolia. Uh, and they just wanted to go home. Um, now, of course, the assassination didn't work, uh, but they did uh, try to accomplish this. Uh, and then he was eventually about uh, 10 days after this assassination attempt captured by the Soviets, uh, where he was uh, marched to uh, Moscow and killed in a firing squad. And this here right here is the, for uh, the photo uh, that was taken right before his execution. So with that in mind, you know, what is his legacy? You know, how did this <laughs> clearly troubled individual try to, uh, you know, leave a legacy for anyone? Well, for one thing, he was responsible, uh, at least in part, for the independence of, China, of uh, Mongolia from China. Um, because uh, the Mongolian independence movement, the revolution, was not going very well. Uh, and he helped march into it, uh, into Mongolia, and drive them out with his uh, Russian movements, Russian forces, not movements. Um, but he also indirectly led to Soviet influence on Mongolia because uh, one of his many political enemies and one of the mainly reasons that the Soviets were able to come into Mongolia uh, so easily while he was uh, invading them is because quite a lot of his uh, political enemies uh, actually believed in communism. Uh, the, they were the Mongolian People's Movement. Um, and so they uh, offered their support to the Soviet army as they were coming in uh, and eventually led to uh, the creation of Mongolia as a uh, communist country for much of the uh, 1900s until the 1990s. Uh, furthermore, <laughs> His attempts of creating a Russian Shambhala and a white utopia uh, was romanticized by the German uh, king, the nation of Germany in the 1930s, uh, especially in novels in 1938 that glorified him as a hero and glorified his attempts to create a white Shambhala while downplaying his brutality uh, and various other things. So, uh, while it's certainly not the only influence that he put on uh, the Nazis, he definitely was an influence, and, it, and he's an influence that should not be ignored. Now, of course, his idea of creating white Shambhala and a new Mongol Empire would have never worked, because, uh, I mean, he wanted to create it word for word as a horse empire uh, based off of cavalry, you know, in a time when, when planes... Uh, and Gatling guns and literal armored battle trains existed. Uh, and I'm not making that up. It, those existed. Uh, there are pictures of them are fairly easy to find. Uh, so it's rather humorous that he even thought this could be accomplished, but he probably wasn't all there anyway. Uh, but that aside, he definitely provided at least some of the ideas uh, to Himmler and Hitler on how to accomplish this uh, alongside um, the idea of root races and various other things. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, and I also want to state, please don't go out and you know harass New Age pagans. Don't harass Wiccans or eclectic pagans or anyone like that. Most if, most if not all of them are not racist. Um, and, you know, and not all of them believe the things that I mentioned, uh, though quite a few of them do. But, the, you know, that doesn't mean that you should go out and make their life a living hell. Uh, like I said, and like in the video that I'll provide in the iCard, we can actually learn quite a lot of things from them, and their practices aren't bad. So, please, just leave them alone. Let them do their practices by themselves. This video was for education purposes on the uh, 
original movements, not the movements as they are now. Uh, so with that, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe, um, and have a good day.